Good morning. I want to welcome everybody. I know things are a little bit different this morning. So unfortunately, there were a few people that had actually been exposed to uh, the COVID virus. And then Robert had given me permission to go ahead and say that he actually tested positive. I went ahead and got myself tested and I tested negative, but uh, it is going to be a little bit of a game changer. We're going to see you know how we're going to proceed forward because we just want to try to keep everybody safe and make sure that we're following you know the proper guidelines so this was last minute i had a i had a teaching prepared uh for for tomorrow something that the lord had put on my heart having to do with walking uh under the leading of the holy spirit versus the flesh it was really a very in-depth teaching um it was going to you know require uh probably a lot of writing on the board and things of that nature. So I'm just going to go ahead and table that teaching for now until the next time I can get behind the pulpit. But uh, this morning, I felt like the Lord put the Psalm 23 on my heart. And so I want to just go ahead and go through this particular Psalm with you. And that's that's what we're going to do this morning we'll, as, as the Lord leads and guides. We're just going to go through Psalm 23 and see what the Lord would have to speak to us through this Psalm that was written by uh, King David. Before we get started, though, let's go ahead and, and go to the Lord in prayer. There's a lot to be prayerful about. Father, we just come to you in prayer this morning, Lord God, and, and we lift up all of these situations and circumstances to you, Lord. We have so much going on in the earth today, Lord. We just want to lift up this nation to you. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray for this upcoming election. We pray that your will for this nation would be done, Lord God. We know that there is a great, there's great chaos all over the earth, all over the globe today. And Lord, we thank you for this great nation that we were born into. I know that I do, Lord. I have seen, I've been to Europe, I've been to Asia, I've been to South America. Lord, I'm grateful to be an American. And I pray for this great nation, Lord God. I pray for President Trump. I pray for the leadership, Lord. We're asking you, Lord, for your mercy, Lord. You see the beginning from the end and all points in between. You know who's telling the truth and who's not telling the truth. You know if there's alternate agendas and plans by men that aren't really right. All we have it many times is our opinions and based upon the word of God. So Lord, we put it in your hands and we're asking you to have your way. We're asking you to be merciful, Lord. We pray, Lord, for the people this morning that are part of our congregation that have fallen ill. There's been a few different people that, that became sick, that were... That were uh, had a direct exposure and so we lift them up to you each and every one of them right now young old lord god whoever they may be lord you see exactly where they are we pray that your healing power would touch them we thank you jesus that you took stripes on your back for our healing lord god and we pray for them lord that you would protect them that you would cause a rapid recovery that you would make them whole lord god we just put them in your hands lord god we pray for the rest of the congregation lord those that maybe were exposed, that haven't shown symptoms. Lord, we just pray that you'd build a hedge of protection around your people, Lord. We pray that you'd give us wisdom as we move forward, Lord God. We pray for the church, Lord God, that you'd give us open windows of opportunity to preach this glorious gospel, Lord, to the lost. Lord, that you'd also help us to be able to make disciples, Lord, for believers that are struggling in their walk, that have a desire to live for you, but don't really understand the word. That's who we believe you have called to yoke with us. That's who we believe you've called to be part of our congregation. And so we lift them up to you, Lord, wherever they may be, north, south, east, west. We pray that you'd bring them in, Lord, and that you'd help us, allow us to help them have a greater understanding of your word. Like you spoke to me so many years ago when I was failing in my walk with you, Present my word for the way that it is written, and then I will use you. Help us, Lord God, as a church, as leadership, to be able to present your word for the way that it is written. So let's go ahead and dive into Psalm chapter 23. Once again, it's a Psalm of David. I have some of the scripture up on the screen, and hopefully you can see it. But as we go through, we're just going to go ahead and read, and we're going to talk about it. It says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You know, there's a, I just want to, you know, st we're going to start off just with the concept of a shepherd. So a shepherd obviously is the guide to the sheep. Well, throughout scripture, the, the Bible talks about the fact that 
that the people of God are like sheep. Amen. And the shepherd is our Lord and the shepherd leads the sheep. Um, us as believers, as Christians in New Testament Christianity are on a journey. I talk about that a lot in the church that we're on a journey. So basically each and every day when we wake up and we, and we get out there, we get in our car, we head to work. We're, we're on a journey. We're navigating life, right? And, and, and we're going in various directions, each and every one of us going in our own directions. And on these journeys, we're finding all kinds of circumstances that we run into. And the reality of it is, is that what it says right here is that because the Lord is our shepherd, because he is the guide of the sheep, we will not want. It means to suffer lack. God wants you and I to know that we can trust him. Many times, whenever we face these circumstances in life and we're going through things, we don't know how. How is God going to provide? How is this situation going to change? And listen, sometimes it's how am I going to pay the light bill? Sometimes it's financial related. And many times people struggle and they have fear in their heart connected to how they're going to pay their bills. But it's bigger than that. Spiritually speaking, if you love the Lord and you find yourself in a bondage type situation, if you find yourself in a circumstance and you don't know how you're going to get free, listen, spiritual bondage can be a very fearful thing. It, it, it will grip you. It will grab a hold of you. And you will begin to question in your heart, how will I ever be able to get out of this? I'm here to tell you, he is your shepherd. And he says, his word says, you shall not want. The question is, will we follow the leading and guiding of the Holy Spirit? That's really what my original message was going to be on this morning. Following after the Spirit versus the flesh. But in verse 2 it says right here, He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. Before we move forward, you know, I kind of looked in the Hebrew to see. And you probably can't see it on the screen, but you might be able to. There's a little bit of a different coloration to he maketh me to lie. It's a little bit darker on there. And if, if you're looking at your Bible, it may be in italics because that was added by the translators. But it's trying to give you the overall context of what's saying. But in the King James, the word maketh, if we're, if we're a little bit confused, then we may take it, oh, well, God's going to make me lie down when I need to lie down. No, God doesn't make you or I do anything. He prepares a way. He, he leads and guides. He, he gives directions through the prompting and through the, through the prompting of the Holy Spirit and through the direction of his word. His word says in Psalm 119, it says that your, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. God's word and the Holy Spirit combined together like a good shepherd would do, lead and guide the sheep down a pathway that's going to bring them to a place of safety. But I got to tell you something. God blessed you and I with a free will. That's another thing that whenever I do preach that message that the Lord put on my heart, I'm going to talk a lot about that, the free will. God, whether we realize it or not, it's a gift. God gave us a free will. In other words, he gave us the gift to be able to make a choice. What he wants us to do is he wants us to take that ability to make a choice, and he wants us, his desire for our heart for his heart is for us to choose him. He wants to lead and guide us. He wants to prepare a place of safety for us. And he wants us to choose his way. He wants us to choose his will. So he's not going to make us, but he's going to prepare for us. And then whenever he brings us to that place, he's saying, listen, this is what I have to offer you. I have green pastures for you. See, a sheep has to be fed. And a sheep eats green grass or he eats whatever grass is provided for him god is the good shepherd wants to provide good green grass he wants to give us revelation and understanding of his word his word is full of counsel his word is full of goodness and if we will eat and feast upon his word and allow that to become our understanding then we're going to be strengthened spiritually and we're going to be able to better hear the voice of the lord so not only does he lead me, make me, or prepare a place for me where I can lie down in green pastures, he also leads me beside still waters, refreshing waters. Listen, waters that aren't torrential, meaning that they're not full of violence, like a, maybe a river in Colorado where you can see the rapids and 
and the spray of the water as it crashes against the rocks. That's not the type of water where the Lord wants to lead and guide us. Yes, sometimes this earth in its fallen state will cause rivers that are full of rapids. Yes, many times the choices that we make in life cause us to find ourselves in these untoward situations, in these, these rivers that are full of rapids. But that's not the kind of water that the Lord would lead us to. If we would listen to his gentle, still, small voice, if we would listen to the prompting of the Holy Spirit, based upon an understanding of his word, he would be leading and guiding us in areas of safety for our lives. Look at verse 3. He says, he restores my soul. I looked that word up before we got started just to kind of to get an idea. But what it says is to build back again. You know, many times whenever we're going through life, because like I mentioned, you know, life can be harsh because of the fallen nature, because of the fall of Adam and the fall of Eve. You know, the word of God says that that the woman would be cursed through childbirth, that man would have to uh, work toil the ground by the sweat of his brow and that the earth would produce thorn and thistle. The word of God says in Romans chapter eight that all creation groans longing for the redemption of the sons of men. What that means is, is that not only did mankind fall because of sin, but also the entirety of the world fell. Uh, the earth produces, there's a curse upon the earth. There's a curse upon man. Sin has caused the curse. But God, the Father, in sending his son Jesus, he brings the blessing. He brings the healing. He brings the opportunity for man to be restored. God desires to restore our soul, to build back up again. You know, so many times our life circumstances have helped to create and shape and mold who we are. Whether it was the way that we were brought up, our upbringing, our parents, the way our mom, our dad, they treated us, the relationships that we've been involved in, our friendships, the places that we've gone, the things that we've done. This is all part of my message I plan to preach for you, but we're doing something different this morning. But all of that has an effect on making the person that we have become. I got I to gotta tell you that. That this world has a way of molding us and forming us. That's straight. I'm not going to turn there, but that's straight out of uh, Romans chapter 12. Do not be conformed to this world means to be molded from an outside source. The world wants to mold you according to its image. Don't be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, God wants to transform us by renewing our mind and causing it to line up according to his word. The fall of man, the fallen nature of this earth, the sin that's upon this earth, the decisions that we make help to mold us. And many times in a very negative fashion, bring us to a place of torrential rivers and, you know, a place that's not good for feeding. But God promises that he wants to bring us to a place where he can restore our soul. He wants to build us back up. Where, where is your life today? What, what, are you, what are you personally experiencing in your life that, that has caused you pain? Because listen, the reality of it is, is that if we're all honest with one another, we can put our smiles on our face and, and some days are better than others. And sometimes the sky is more blue than other days. But the reality is, is that we've all experienced pain, heartache, frustrations, whether it was somebody that we trusted, did something wrong to us, whatever the case, those elements of life tend to try to break us down, sin tries to break us down, frustrate us. The word of God promises that he wants to build us back up. He wants to restore our soul. I want to talk to you about the soul a little bit. That was going to be in my original message. I'm not going to overdo it. But I want you to know that the soul in the Greek language, I mean, we're reading out of the Hebrew. I mean, this is the Old Testament. But in the Greek language, the word soul is the word suke. And if you spelled it out in an English form, you would get psyche. So a big part of the soul, which is the inner man, has to do with our mind. It has to do with who we are. Really, your soul is your individuality. 
It's what makes Matt mad and whoever else is watching, put your name in the blank. Your soul is who you are as an individual. The fall of man, the curse of the earth, all of these things, relationships and job, places that we've gone, places that we've been, choices that we've made, build, have, have whether they've served to deconstruct and tear down our individuality, but at the same time, God says, I'm here to rebuild you. I want to restore you. I, if you will trust me and let me be your, your shepherd, I will lead you to a place where you can be nourished. I will lead you to a place where you can be hydrated. I'm talking about spiritual nourishment and hydration to where your soul, your individuality, whoever you are, all the hurts that you've had. Listen to me. The psychologist is going to tell you he's going to fix you. He's going to put you on the couch. He's going to try to give you a medicine. He can't fix you. The, the deep internal hurts that have taken place because of whatever you've been through, only God, the creator of your soul, the one who has stamped his copyright, his image in your heart and life, he is the only one that can heal you. But you and I have to come to a place where we will release our lives into his hands and we will say, Please restore us. Listen, he wants to lead us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. The idea of a path of righteousness is just basically going in the right direction. Can I get an amen? I mean, there's a wrong path and there's a right path. And each and every day as we're on this journey and we're asking the good shepherd to lead and guide us in the right direction, Many times believers find themselves going down paths that are not upright. That's really what the word righteousness means here. It describes a path of uprightness. It describes a path of just basically making the right decision. Decisions that are going to do what? That are going to be for his name's sake. Even the word sake right there, I had to look it up in the English dictionary this morning, but it says for the cause of for the account of, for the benefit of. Whenever we're talking about being led down a path of righteousness for his name's sake. So basically what we're saying is, yes, the earth is fallen. Yes, there's all kinds of choices that can be made. And there's always two different pathways that can be taken. But the Holy Spirit is desiring to lead us down the right pathway. And the reason why is, is because he wants the pathway that we choose to result in a benefit for his name. See, whenever you and I allow the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us and bring us down the right path, it brings glory to God. It shows the world around us. Listen to me, if we're out there living a life that's unholy, that's blatantly sinful, and we're making decisions and we're sitting here saying, Oh, you know, yes, I'm a Christian and I love Jesus. Listen, I'm not trying to beat anybody down. I'm not trying to be condemning. I'm preaching to the preacher. But I'm just trying to make a point that when we vocalize and we say Jesus or we talk about the Lord and at the same time we're living an alternate lifestyle that does not bring glory to God, we're, t we're sending mixed messages and it's not to the benefit of his name. God will never lead us down a pathway that will not cause benefit to his name. His desire is that we would handle our business right and not crooked. Come on, somebody, help me out with that one. He does not want us to be crooked. He does not want us to cheat on our taxes. He does not want us to cheat other people. He wants us to handle our business upright and in a way that it brings him glory. That's his word. He goes on to say this in verse 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You know, sometimes, you know, the idea of a valley is that it's got very steep walls. Almost difficult, really, when you look, at, when you look it up in the Hebrew. Uh, the idea is, is that, you know, it's got these steep pre precipices, this steep wall. In, in other words, it's difficult to get out of. Sometimes we find ourselves... In spiritual valleys, in spiritual bondages, I've been there before. And I don't even know how in the world am I ever going to get out of this situation. Why did I open up the door that led me down into this deep, dark valley? How will I ever get out of here? 
I have to tell you that sometimes when we're in that valley, there's like an overhanging shadow of death that's breathing down our back. I mean, as I'm sitting here by this window and I'm looking out at the sky, it's very overcast this morning. It's like a shadow. It's darker than normal. The sun's not as bright in the sky, you know, and many times that's what it feels like in our life. Loved ones, maybe if you're not experiencing it personally, you have loved ones that you know good and well. They've opened up doors that have led them into the valley of death and that the shadow of death is hanging over them. But I'm here to tell you, the psalmist said, even though I might find myself in that valley, because there were many times in David's life that his enemies were trying to kill him. And he didn't know. They he was outnumbered. They were stronger than him. And he didn't know how he was going to be delivered. He had to come to the place. He had no way out. There was no way for him to fix his situation. But yet he looked to the Lord. And God showed up to deliver him out. He said that even though I'm in this valley and the shadow of death looms over me, I will fear no evil. You know, the word of God says that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. God does not want you and I living from panic attack to panic attack, living in anxiety, but instead he wants his holy, he wants us to be able to trust him and he wants his Holy Spirit to be able to give us strength. He says, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Do you not know that this morning, that God is with you? I'm telling you right now, the father went through extreme circumstances to send his son Jesus to die on the cross for your sin and for my sin so that you and I could be made one with him through Christ. He did all of that so that the Holy Spirit could be with us and so that we would never have to go on this journey alone. You're the sheep, he's the shepherd the psalmist said, I will fear no evil for you are with me. He goes on to say this. He says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now, I have to tell you this, that there's probably a lot that could be said about the rod and the staff. In some ways, the rod and the staff, they do. They describe elements of discipline. They definitely describe elements of authority. You know, sometimes a rod is is talked about in the Bible as a rod of correction. Um, and certainly there's a big aspect to that. The shepherd of our life, he does. He brings correction to our lives. Really, a shepherd would have to use these tools many times to pull a, a stray sheep back into the fold. You know, sheep kind of like you and I, that's many times why we're alluded to as sheep in the Bible. But because of the free will that we have, we, we do. We have a tendency to venture off, maybe even out of curiosity. You know, uh, we see something over there and we're like, oh, what's that? Let me go check that out, even though it's out of the way or the path where the Lord would have us to go. Many times they would have these the shepherd's staffs and it has like the little hook on it. It's called a scepter. And they would be able to pull the sheep back in their direction or they'd be able to hook the leg. I've read many stories, I'm kind of shooting from the hip right here, but where when you had a sheep that was persistently going in the wrong direction, even sometimes the shepherd would break the sheep's hip leg. And it seems so cruel, but he was doing it for the purpose of training the sheep because the sheep left to himself was going to keep going in the wrong direction. So let me just say this to you. If you're going in the wrong direction, and suddenly you find yourself where something happens in your life and it gets you stuck in a place and you can't move. And at first you feel very frustrated about it and you question, why is it that this happened? You have to remind yourself that if you were going in a wrong direction, that the good shepherd loved you and he wants to provide a place for you where you can be nourished, where you can be hydrated. And if you, like a, a sheep that was unwilling to go in the right direction, or if I, like a sheep unwilling to go in the right direction, keep going off in the wrong direction, sooner or later, he's gonna reach out there and he's gonna grab us because he loves us. And he's going to put us in a position where we won't hurt ourselves. I don't really have time to get into all these details, but 
the, 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 from the shepherd's staff is the concept of a scepter. And I just think that this is an interesting concept that back in ancient days, the kings, many of the kings, whenever they came up with the concept of the king's staff, it started off, many of the kings actually were shepherds back in ancient days. And it's just interesting that you can do that history, you can do that research into history and you can see that the shepherd's staff also known as the scepter, became the symbol of kingly authority and that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, was a shepherd, amen, or he is known as, spiritually speaking, the good shepherd. A little bit of a transition here. He says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup runs over. You know, I just want to say this, that on this concept right here, the psalmist was saying, I'm going through a lot of things and I don't really know how I'm going to get out of this, but I do know who's going to get me out. And it's the good shepherd. And many times we find ourselves in situations and circumstances. And right here he's saying, even in the presence of my enemies, what did God do? He prepared a table for him. The whole idea of a table, of a preparation of a table describes provision so again you find yourself in a circumstance in a situation and you don't know how you're going to get out it seems impossible but what god wants you to know is he will provide for you he will provide what it is that you need it's not always going to be what you want i, I get just as frustrated about that sometimes as the next guy you know, I preached a message one time, I want what I want, and I want it right now. All of us, as human beings, have our own will. All of us have our own desires. And when our desires line up according to the Word of God, many times God will bless us with those desires. But many times our desires don't line up with the Word of God. And if He allowed us to have those things, it would bring us in the wrong direction. What I'm here to tell you, though, is this, is that wherever you are, and whatever it is that you really need, God knows exactly what you need and he knows exactly where you are. I'm here to tell you he's your provider. He will provide a table for you, even in the presence of your enemies. There may be people surrounding you. There might be people that are full of envy and animosity against you. People that even love God and don't even realize that they're filled with envy and jealousy and animosity. Those are lusts of the flesh. That's clean. <clears throat> That's very uh, obvious when we read uh, Galatians chapter 5. But a lot of times people don't even know that they have those things in their heart. They don't even realize that they're full of envy and jealousy. They can't even see themselves. Many times they're operating with a natural mindset. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says... The natural mind cannot perceive the things of God, but instead they are spiritually understood. You know, for a person to realize that they have envy and jealousy and animosity towards another human being, they got to be real with themselves. But I'm here to tell you, that's not for you to stress over. Even if there's people that are against you and they're playing the enemy against you, I'm here to tell you the Word of God says He loves you and He will prepare a table for you. He will provide for you. You just got to make sure you're willing to humble yourself and submit to the will of God. If you don't get things done your way, if it doesn't all go your way, maybe it wasn't God's will for your life that it go that way. At the same time that he's trying to protect you against other people, he's also trying to get a hold of your heart. There's things in your life, there's things in my life, when he allows these circumstances of life to take place, where he's trying to get our attention. If we call ourselves Christian, do you think that he's ignoring the fact that we're like a wayward sheep going in the wrong direction and he's desiring to pull us back? The very staff that he uses many times are trials and tribulations. He will allow situations to take place that will get our attention, that will pull us back on the pathway. Don't get frustrated and aggravated and go around blaming everybody else. Oh, look what they're doing to me. Hold on a second. Nothing happened in Job's life that God did not allow. God is the one who can stop a situation or who can allow a situation to take place. Yes, did those people do wrong? Absolutely. But do you think God couldn't have stopped them from doing it to begin with? No. 
God allowed these things to take place in our life for a purpose. Because while people have a free will to make their own free will choices and many times to go in the wrong direction, God says that he loves you, he loves me, and he is committed to doing the work right here. I got to be honest with you, I'm realizing more and more, God's not near as worried about my bank account, what kind of car I drive. Oh, everybody else might be worried about that. Oh, look at the preacher. He never would get him a new car. Ha ha, how funny is that car look? Or his house. God's so much less concerned about my house and my car and my financial situation than he is my heart. And if he can begin to allow, if, if I will begin to allow him to do a work on the inside of me and on the inside of my heart, then guess what? Many times those other things begin to flow in my life. And that's where he talks about it. He says, you will prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup runs over. God wants to cause your cup to run over. God wants to bless you. And the anointing on your head describes the anointing of the Holy Spirit. That's, that's really the idea. There's some of this terminology even in the New Testament. And the word in the New Testament for anointing would describe charisma. Not charisma, but charisma. And it literally means to be smeared with oil. Old Testament passages describe the anointing oil that rolled down Aaron's beard. Describes the anointing of young King David as king. So the high priest was anointed. The king was anointed. But when we take this concept into New Testament theology... Now what we're talking about is that the ultimate fulfillment of the anointed one was Jesus. Because the word Christ literally means anointed one. So the anointed one has come. The Father sent him. And now through salvation. So whenever the gospel was presented to us and before we got saved, we were out there in that world. We were a wayward sheep. We were probably finding ourselves tumbling in rough and violent waters, trying to eat dead grass, not knowing where we were going, going in the wrong direction. The enemy was getting the best of us. And then we heard the good news of the gospel. And whenever we responded by faith, that's talking about Romans chapter 10, when you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, the Bible says that you can be saved. Saved from sin, saved from condemnation, saved from guilt, saved from an eternity in a devil's hell. Hell was not created for mankind, it was created for the devil and his angels. But those that reject the salvation of Jesus Christ, those whose name, Revelation chapter 20, will not find them their name written in the Lamb's book of life, written in the book of eternal life, they will also find their lot cast into the lake of fire. Eternal judgment, along with the, the, the beast, along, I'm sorry, along with the dragon, the, the antichrist, the false prophet, all those whose names are not written in the book of life will find themselves as part of that in eternity of judgment. But I'm here, I got good news. But he anointeth our head with oil. He sent the anointed one, Jesus the Christ. And you got the opportunity to hear the good news of the gospel. And when you responded by faith, believing in your heart, not just lip service, child of God. No, not just lip service, but in your heart, you believed. And with your mouth, you confessed. And you said, yes, God. Whenever that happened, the Word of God says in Ephesians 1.13, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. What that means is the Holy Spirit came to live in your life. That's the same idea as the fact that as you were anointed. Your head was anointed with the oil of the Holy Spirit. God has placed His seal upon you. And because God is with you and not against you, He will fill your cup up. He will allow your cup to run over with spiritual blessings, with the blessings that he can entrust into your life. The psalmist goes on to say this, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God wants you to know that he wants to be with you every step of the way, every day of your life. If you and I will learn to trust him and learn to trust his leading and his guidance, his goodness will follow us for the days of our life. Yes, there's an eternity to embrace. Yes, there's a kingdom 
for us to embrace a life of goodness, an eternal life where we serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the millennial reign of Christ, where we rule and reign with him, where the parable of the talents, where we each one of us were faithful with when he gave us upon this earth, that he said you were faithful with a few things, now enter in and be ruler over many things. That day is coming when we're going to be able to, to partake and enjoy the things that our king has prepared for us. He's prepared a table for us. But even before that time comes, that's going to be a beautiful and a glorious day. Amen. Where the wolf and the lamb lie together. Where the lion eats straw. Where the child can put his hand on a snake's hole and not be hurt. Where the spirit of Antichrist will be locked up. Where the spirit of the Christ, Jesus, will be the prevailing force in the atmosphere. What a beautiful day that will be. But listen, even before then, surely... Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. God wants his goodness and his mercy to follow us. If you don't experience it right now, you need to understand something. God is trying to get your attention. God is trying to speak to you. His word and his will is that his goodness and that his mercy will follow you, will follow me each and every day of our lives. And ultimately, you need to know this. I'm closing with this. That we will one day dwell in the house of the Lord forevermore. I hope you got something out of today's teaching. Let's pray real quick before we disconnect. And we're going to be giving you some more information about what's going to be happening over the next week or so as far as services go. I hope that you were able to tune in this morning. Father, in the name of Jesus, I lift up everyone that was able to listen to this message. I pray for them and their families, Lord God. I pray that you would keep them safe. I pray that you would keep them protected, Lord, from this pandemic, Lord God. But, Lord, we also pray again for this nation and all the crazy things that are going on in this world. But what we do know is this. You are our shepherd, Lord. And you will cause us to lie down by still, in green pastures beside still waters. You want to comfort us. You want to take care of us, Lord. The, the answer to the problems is to trust you. Even though we can't always see it, we do know that you have the answer. Lord, you have not given us a spirit of fear. And so help us, Lord, even though sometimes we find ourselves, whether it be personally or where we are in the time frame of life, it seems like maybe we're in the valley of the shadow of death. But by your grace, we will fear no evil. We will put our hope and our trust in you. We thank you, Lord, for your protection. In Jesus' name, amen.